Hey fist friends, Zenzo with Tazawa Tanks. Today we've got a different kind of video. So how's everyone doing? Hope you're doing well. Thanks for tuning in. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. It's different because I had a chance to do an interview with a very respected and well-known fish keeper in the hobby and uh, I couldn't pass up the chance. My friend Carlos from Backyard Aquatics uh, knows this gentleman and uh, made the introductions and uh, we were able to go to his home and film and uh, I really got a chance to uh, hear a long history about fish keeping and uh, everything that this gentleman has done. So this person is uh, Francis Glennon. He uh, worked at the Steinhardt Aquarium here in San Francisco which is now called the California Academy of Sciences. You may have seen that video. But uh, anyway, um, we had a chance to go to his home and he gave us kind of the whole history of him working and fish keeping, etc. So hopefully you enjoy this video. It is quite long. I will warn you, it's very long. So this might be a good chance for you to turn up the volume, put on some headphones, maybe clean an aquarium, clean out your canister filter or something while you're listening along. Hey everybody, here with uh, Frank Glennon. Frank was the uh, is the uh, former curator at the Steinhardt Aquarium. You've seen that video before at the uh, California Academy of Sciences, which uh, formerly was called Steinhardt Aquarium. And uh, Carlos from Backyard Aquatics is here. And uh, Carlos uh, knows Frank and uh, thought we could get together, talk to Frank a little bit, talk about some fish, learn uh, his history, and uh, just get some, some real uh, knowledge here. So. Uh, Frank, good to meet you. Good Thank meet you, you for uh, having us up to your welcome. beautiful home here in Sonoma. So I guess uh, we'll just talk about some fish. Um, I have a few questions if you don't mind. Uh, one of my uh, one thing that I'd like to know, and a lot of people that watch this uh, channel will probably be interested in kind of learning how you got involved in fish, because a lot of us are, you know, kind of crazy hobbyists, and we all have different avenues on how we got involved. And I know you have a long history, so sure. kind of take us back to when you first put your first fish in a glass box and where that took you. Okay, okay, well I grew up in the uh, Inner Sunset District in San Francisco. It was very close to Golden Gate Park within walking distance. And the Steinhardt Aquarium, you know, uh, it was uh, like the other attractions there in the park, they're free. So as a kid, um, my brother and I were very much interested in, in natural history. And uh, oftentimes we'd go to the park play hide and seek in the old Steinhardt <laughs> Aquarium because right. it was dark. Right, I remember. And uh, you could go in one of two or three different ex uh, entrances or exits. And uh, then we go off in the park and, and um, play there. So uh, I, I still recall some of the, some of the, uh, the exhibits that were there. Um, you know, a lot of it was before I got interested in, right. in keeping fish as a hobby. But, but gradually it gravitated into a, uh, uh, an interest. I had a, a next door neighbor, uh, his name was Ed Robertson, and he was a member of the Aquarium Society back during uh, the late 40s, okay. during, during World War II, the late right. 40s, early 50s. And uh, I remember my dad telling me that during the war years, uh, he built a fish room onto the back of his, his house. And uh, uh, after the, uh, the war, uh, he was not so much interested in the hobby any longer. Right. I think he wanted, wanted to make money, okay. uh, money which, which uh, yeah, I think a, is a myth, right. I mean, for most of us. But, uh, but anyway, he gravitated into other interests, and uh, he gave us a 10-gallon tank that he had in his little fish room, and in it was one little white cloud. Okay. That uh, had survived, I guess, somehow. Right. And uh, so from there, uh, you know, uh, we, we would get goldfish every year. There was a, uh, an aquarium store in the inner, uh, about 18th Avenue and Irving Street called the Blue Lagoon Aquarium. Okay. And, uh, no longer there. Right. Yeah, no longer there. <laughs> gone. And uh, the owner was a guy named Ted Steinhauer. And I always thought, well, he had to have something to do with the Steinhardt Aquarium. Right. The names were so similar. Right. But, of course, he didn't. But he had a, a wonderful little store. Right. Uh, he had all, you know, the bread and butter stuff. But a, every time we'd go in there, he'd have something new. And he'd sell us a pair of bettas. Or he'd sell us a pair of cichlids. Or he'd sell us a pair of killifish right. or something. So you were the curator at the Steinhardt Aquarium. Well, I, so. I'd have to correct you. I was never, I was a senior aquatic biologist. Okay. I was, in quotes, uh, the curator of my own section. Okay, got it. I uh, was fortunate enough to make most of the decisions 
Um, I had free reign for uh, most of the time I was there to do whatever I wanted, plan the exhibits, collect the specimens, and put together, uh, for the most part, they were geographically compatible communities. Okay. Because with the larger fish, that's the area that I took care of, uh, compatibility is pretty important. Sure, sure. And much, much the public predation. are looking at right. these exhibits. You want the exhibit to look good, but you want the fish, primarily the fish in the exhibit, to present themselves right. well. So as the years went by, I, I put together a fairly uh, diverse collection of freshwater fish. And when were you there? What years? I, I was hired in 1976, okay. and I retired in 2010. So right. I was there for wow. the better part of 30, Long 40, time. 34 years. Yeah. So what would you say, and, and I'm kind of stealing one of Carlos's questions, what would you say would, you, would be one of your biggest accomplishments while you were there? Uh, w moving some of those, when, when we went into transition, um, the uh, uh, it was decided that after the Loma Prieta earthquake mm -hmm. that uh, the building had been compromised right. not just the aquarium somewhat but the the rest of the Academy of Sciences so so there was a move then to raise the old structure both right. the aquarium and the Academy and rebuild um, uh, a new facility uh, so the challenge there was, was unfortunately, uh, initially, most of my collection, um, it was, it was uh, decided that it would be saved and housed downtown. On the market A street, lot of the marine right. fish, for instance, that uh, people may remember the roundabout. Yes, the roundabout, yeah. Those fish were given away right. to um, Aquarium yeah. by the Bay, right. Monterey, right. Uh, anybody that would take them. Right. So, but most of the, uh, the fresh, large freshwater fish that I had we're going to be housed down on Howard Street right. uh, near uh, near the Moscone Center yep. is where the temporary facility right. was. So I was pretty happy with that. It means I, I was able to keep most of what I'd had for a number of years. So uh, just moving those fish, I mean, I didn't lose any sleep over it, but, right. but it was it was a challenge. Fortunately, we were able to, to uh, anesthetize a number of the big big freshwater fish even our arapaima wow which even though it's an air breather sure you know you can sedate them right we use this uh, stuff called ms222 mm -hmm. and uh, i don't know what the chem chemical component is but it worked okay. and uh, we had to move the piranhas right i could just knock them out but on uh, moving the fish from the steinhardt to the temporary facility right. and uh so uh it, it went very very smoothly um we didn't lose any of the fish in the transition, wow. but moving the fish down to the, the 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 temporary facility, you had to move all the big alligator gars. Right. They they weren't a problem. We had to move the big arapaima, which was about a five footer, I think, mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. And uh, that that uh, I was a little nervous about that, but it went it went fine. And then of course we had to move after four years. We had to move everything back. Right. And by that time, we had two large aeropyma. Yeah. The five-footer was now a six-footer. Yeah. And they're a little and bigger the, now. Yeah, even. Yeah. Yeah. They're bigger now. They're yeah. still there. Yeah, they're still there. And um, so uh, we, uh, I had to find, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of, of uh, shipping containers for mm -hmm. something that large. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I had done is one day I went out to the, uh, the new facility. The building had been built. The tanks were up and pretty much running. And I was just looking around for something we could ship these or, or move these aeropyma right. in. And there were these two tubs that were about six foot long or right. so. And uh, all they needed was a, was a, uh, a standpipe or something to plumb them. Right. You know, there was a hole in the bottom. You just had to cork that, put a plywood top to it. Right. And they would have been perfect. And they were. They worked out perfectly. And uh, we got them to the uh, back of the um, of the academy mm -hmm. I, I think even the public had started to go in there at that point or they were having members days right. or something sure. or donor days or something and I'm thinking I'm really nervous about this because if one of these jumps right, up it's, 150 these pounds containers, it's gonna kill somebody. it's, it's gonna die <laughs> right. it's gonna die right on right, right. on public view here right. so so the first one we got out was the larger one which uh, went pretty smoothly mm -hmm. The second one, and you didn't want to, you didn't want to completely knock them out sure. because when they went into the tank, the, the, you, you right. had to have somebody in there to get them to the right. surface to breathe. 
So, uh, so uh, we got in there, we put a little of the MS-222, and this fish started to get real squirrely. Right. And if you know anything about Arapaima, they love to jump. Right. And right. when they weigh, you know, 75, 100 pounds or something right. like that. So the thing started to get real, real squirrely. Well, we had, unfortunately, a stretcher that was big enough to contain the fish. Mm -hmm. I said, we got to move this guy, and we got to move him now. Right. And we did. We got him, we got him in there. We got him into the tank. That was the frosting on the cake for me. I said at that point, I've done what I've, I, I've accomplished what I right. wanted to do. Right. You wow. know, and the two, the two of them are still there. There's a third one in there that we got as a fry, and they raised it uh, while it was in, uh, in holding. And uh, I, I got to get down there and see them sometime because. When was uh, the last time you were down there? Uh, it was probably uh, a few. Well, it was probably. Uh, Probably during during last summer. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't get down to the city as often as I'd like. Sure. And uh, uh, I need to get to see Alan, uh, Jan, who still works there. Mm -hmm. I need to get uh, together with him and catch up and uh, um, see what's going on there. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So how do you feel about, so I'm very fond of the old aquarium, um, probably because it's nostalgia and that's what I grew up looking at. And then, you know, the new one, um, it took me some time, to, and I'm a member, so I go frequently, but it took me some time to get adjusted to the new aquarium and kind of get a feel for it. What do you, how, how do you feel about the new versus the old, and where does your heart lie? Well, obviously with the old, right. because I had 20-plus uh, large. When I say large, I had everything from about a 500 to a 10,000-gallon tank, which isn't considered large by today's standards. Sure. The 10,000-gallon tank, I had the... Uh, alligator gar in okay you know and i think there's still some uh, some of the original gar that are still there that were brought to the uh, aquarium in the late 1940s wow. early 50s wow. so they're over 60 years old that's amazing in fact they're not much much uh, you know they're almost as old as i am right so uh you know uh i believe there's still several of those there and um uh, we had uh, the next tank we had was like a six or seven thousand gallon tank, which was we called it the. Uh, it was the director at the time wanted to call it the mud bank tank because we had a fabricated uh, backdrop put mm -hmm. on. It was just a bare. It's like a swimming pool sure. before. Right. So they wanted something to look look more natural. So right. the, they had just done the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the fabricators then came up and put this backdrop on uh, this mud bank tank. And it was, it was a hodgepodge tank for large freshwater fish that really couldn't go anywhere else. Right. So we had some big uh, Pangasius catfish. Okay. We had a big uh, African Dystocotus. Uh, we had um, some Paku, uh, not so much the Paku because they were in the Amazon tank, but it was, uh, it was a, an assortment right. of large freshwater fish. And then uh, we had a 6,000-gallon Amazon tank, um, and then down, down from there, you know, we had 1,300 gallons. So, so I was able to uh, uh, to play with a very, very diverse collection. And one of the ways we'd get fish was was a donation. Right. People would have an arowana. <laughs> Hey, we'll we'll take it. Sure. I mean, there's, you never outgrow out, out your need for arowana, right. you know. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, when I was able, we had enough holding uh, for these sorts of fish. And uh, you know, when the Tennessee Aquarium opened, I believe in the early '90s, we we gave them uh, three uh, full-grown um, silver arowana. Mm -hmm. We gave them uh, some stingray, I believe. And then we gave them one of our beluga sturgeons, along with two lake sturgeons that were, were surplused out. Right. And uh, Vancouver, we gave them a small arapaima at one point. We gave them, I believe, some marijuana and some uh, stingrays. We were breeding uh, freshwater stingrays right. uh, uh, at one <clears throat> point. Very, very, very prolific when, they, when you get a female that's big enough. Right. right. You know, usually they start with two, then they go to four. And we actually had so many that we gave some to the San Francisco Zoo when they had their little tropical stream in right. their aviary. Right, right. So, uh, so I was able to, I couldn't accept everything. Sure, Because, you sure. know, I mean, Paku were a dime, a dime a dozen. Right. And uh, I, would, I would just tell people, you know, please, if you're going to take it and dump it into the Sacramento River right. or a local waterway, give it to me. Right. I'll take it. Right. No questions asked. 
and uh, so it, it, it worked. It worked. Uh, it worked pretty yeah. well. So I had a very, very, uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, very. One guy came in there one time. I think he was a veterinarian with a school group, and he says, "You know, you got too many fish in these tanks." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the tank was was not on its own. So it was on a huge, giant huge filtration, giant right. filtration system. Right. So we could crowd them. Sure. And what I wanted to do was show show the diversity of, of the freshwater fish right. in more or less geographically compatible communities. So I'd have an Asian barb tank with some Asian catfish, maybe an Asian arowana, right. you know, and then I'd have a uh, West African tank. We had a mabu puffer. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, we had a uh, hydrocinus. We had the uh, goli uh, tiger fish. Oh, wow. At one point, uh, we had uh, you know some tilapia budicophori. Right. Uh, you know, if I could get them in there compatibly, right. they'd be in there. Sure. And um, for the most part, uh, you know, it worked. You know, the hydrocinus ate a uh, hepsidosoto. I mean, that's another large predatory African kerosene. Right. One day I came in, it was gone. Yeah. And I knew <laughs> I knew why it had gone. The hydrocinus had eaten it. So, uh, you know, you win some, you lose a few, but right. by, by and large, you know, I was pretty pleased with uh, with the section. I even had a, a Mexican fishes, uh, small Mexican fishes uh, exhibit with, uh, with uh, some of the uh, Mexican, smaller Mexican cichlids. I had mm -hmm. Astyanix in there mm -hmm. that somebody had collected. They're illegal <laughs> in California, right. but you know they gave them to me. And once we had them, we put them on our, we put them on their, we put them on the prohibited species list. Right. We just accept them as an anonymous donation, sure. and we used to get piranha that way. You know. Now speaking of piranha, I heard that you actually bred some red bellies. Yeah, we did. Right. Yeah, which which we weren't supposed to do. Uh, because we didn't have the permit to do that. Right. But I mean, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we got to the point just before the we made the transition, we were down to about um, six or eight specimens. Mm -hmm. Right. And then one day I'm out there and you could see what obviously were males right. that were starting to get territorial. Right. And most of the females in there, you know, I mean, they were so big and so fat, they were just full of eggs. Full of eggs, right. And uh, they spawned in there as we were actually moving some of the fish downtown. There was a guy, a very good volunteer, who was actually covering the aquarium while I had to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I just told him, I said, get that egg mass out of there. Right. And we had a, a plastic tub. All it was, we had a... Uh, you remember the tropical room, the tropical mm -hmm. panel with all the small 10-gallon right. tanks? Right. Uh, beautiful area behind there for, for small holding. Right. And we put a tub in there, and we must have had 10,000 fry wow. from that egg, egg mat. Well, I, I knew that most of them were going to make it. Sure. So we hit them with the BBS, and, you know, then we'd right. have 5,000, and then we were down to 1,000, right. and then we're down to 500. So anyway, we ended up with about 50 of them, okay. which were, you know, like quarter size. Sure. And I knew at that point, you know, we were still probably going to use a lose a few sure and we ended up with 25 which were perfect for the exhibit wow. down in the transition nice so uh, so that uh, it, it worked out I was pretty pleased with that so a lot of our viewers uh, are younger um, teenagers early 20s and I think a lot of the folks would be interested in learning how they can also get a job in the aquarium hobby. I know there's not a lot of those jobs available. So what advice would you give to somebody that's uh, maybe looking at starting a career as an aquarist? Yeah, uh, one, one of the things is, is to volunteer if you can, because you need the hands-on experience and then people get to know what kind of a worker you are. Right. A number of people, both, both while I was there and even to this present day, I can't speak for the existing staff now because a lot of the staff are new, but a lot of them not only have a, a biology background or environmental background of some yeah. sort, but they also have some hands-on experience. Right. And those two are, are uh, probably, uh, probably required now. They, they want a biology background mm -hmm. uh, and or zoology background. And I think it, uh, and, if you've, and if you've worked uh, with, with fish, right. you know, in a, in a, um, a research capacity, you know, that mm -hmm. would help. And uh, but the volunteering is 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 important. Getting to know people, it's 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 who you know helps very much these days. Great, great yeah. advice. Mine is actually I'm more interested in the filtration side of the stuff. 
what was the filtration like that and behind the scenes? Yeah, it it uh, it was a very very simple system. They were open bay. We had six different water systems uh, for the for the aquarium. Now your roundabout had its own bank of filters, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the swamp had its own filter. It was a it was a it was a pressurized sand filter for the for the swamp. But the fish tanks were all on on a kind of an open bay uh, system. Uh, uh, the water. Uh, I used to have to give uh, when I give the tours. I'd always start with the filtration area there because people were interested to know how that worked. And uh, you had uh, uh, in the filter, you had very very fine material on top. To, to gradually coarser material down through the filter bed. And the engineers, what they would have to do periodically, they'd have to make sure that that, that, that upper level uh, layer of fine sand, they'd have to rake it to break up the crust that the bacteria would form in there to make sure that the flow through the filter bed was, was even. Um, uh, the water then, uh, once it flowed through the filter bed, went down into a cistern. From the cistern, it was pumped up to the roof where we had what were called head tanks. And the water up there was aerated. Aerated, held, and then gravity fed back down into the uh, display tanks. The filtration system, it worked. The problem was that, uh, that uh, a series of tanks were on the same filter. If you didn't quarantine properly, you got a disease in one of those tanks, it would end up in all of them. Right. One of the disease problems we had uh, was ick. We'd get ick in the tropical, tropical fresh system. We'd even get ick in our trout system. Very rarely, but in the hot fresh system, it would move very, very quickly because of the high temperature. Right. We kept the, kept the temperature uh, at about 80, 81 degrees. What we'd do if we got ick in the hot fresh, boost it up to 86. We couldn't treat with chemicals because right. we had catfish. We had, uh, uh, had all kinds of things that were sensitive to, to malachite and, and, um, and uh, chemicals. So we would boost the temperature to 86. It would stress the hell out of the fish. But by and large, we, if we got it soon enough, we would nip it in, nip it in the bud. Um, a job first thing in the morning was to look at your exhibits, look for any signs of disease. And uh, we had problems with argillus, fish lice. Mm -hmm. We had problems with anchorworm, especially if we caught anything uh, in our normal fresh, if we caught uh, some of the native fish. Uh, uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to prophylactically treat them. You just couldn't put them in the system. Even if you held them in quarantine for a couple of weeks and they didn't come down with ick, you had to be careful that they, they were carrying the larval stage of the anchorworm. Right. And lo and behold, they got an anchor worm, then you had a serious problem. And you couldn't get rid of it just by plucking the adults. You had to kill, you had to get rid of the adults, and then you had to, to kill off the larvae. And uh, make sure all the eggs that were there were hatched, and then kill off the larvae. So it was a challenge. It was a challenge. And part of the problem was I had one, one part of the freshwater system. So it really depended upon what the other guy was doing because some of his tanks were on also on the same system. Mm -hmm. So if a disease started in one of the panel tanks, it would work its way through the filter and it would end up in mine. You know? So I had to be careful too because if I started something, it would end up in right. his. So the quarantine was very, very important. Um, we had a, a, a group of uh, stationary engineers. They had a monitor. We had a thing called the Johnson Control Panel and it monitored uh, temperature, because that's crucial. You know, the trout, want, we wanted to keep them about 52, 53 degrees Fahrenheit. We had a normal fresh system, it was basically ambient, you know, right. you know, 50s, 60s. And then we'd have the uh, tropical system, we called it hot fresh or hot salt. Um, the hot fresh was about, we kept it about 81, because then it wasn't a giant leap to get it to 86 if we had to boost it right up. Right. We, we wouldn't do a degree a day. We'd get it right up to 86 degrees. Then when we bring it down, we drop it a degree a day, you know, in yeah. order not to, uh, to to shock the fish too much because we didn't want to get rid of it. Yeah. yeah, the ick's <laughs> there all the time. Yeah. You know, it's it's a stress-related protozoan. So, so it was in our system all the time. Then we'd get bacterial infections. 
We had a virus uh, at one point. Um, a lady that worked in the lab, Pat Morales, I was getting this uh, what I call fat lip disease. And it, it would uh, show itself in New World cichlids, some of the South American cichlids like the Psittacum, um, you know, and, uh, not so much the Severums, uh, chocolate cichlids, and then in some of the, uh, the other uh, Central American cichlids, they would stop eating, they would become list listless, and then the mouth parts would start to swell. And I called it fat lip disease. And we actually sent a, I believe it was a dovii up to UC Davis, and they did find evidence of some bacteria, but it, it wasn't a bacterial infection. Uh, that was the problem, so, so they deduced it was viral. Mm -hmm. So because we had so many different fish on that same filtration system, that, you know, it's inevitable you're going to get something in there, right. you know, and maybe something just mutated mm -hmm. in there. And uh, anyway. So I do have other questions about, uh, like, stuff that you've, things that you've read at Steinhardt. So one is, uh, um, what fish would you say probably bred most often in the facility? And then also, what species or what fish were you just completely surprised that even yeah. spawned in the... Okay. In the, well, well uh, in there. cichlids would, would oftentimes they, they breed on their own in the exhibits, you know. And, uh, but we had a, uh, we had a pair, I had a pair of Scleropages formosus, uh, Asian arowana, mm -hmm. and they were off exhibit. They were the um, green form, what's called the green form. They weren't golds or reds. Right. And we had a, a large um, holding tank in our basement. They had removed one of the old boilers and they had put this, this big uh, fiberglass tank in there, which must have held a you know, couple of thousand gallons. And I'd keep it half level. And I put what I thought was a pair of these um, uh, Asian arowanas in there. And I watched them and watched them and watched them. And I'd seen videos, I think in Japan, where they had gotten these things to breed. And they're very compatible, very compatible. And they would swim together. And uh, lo and behold, at one point, one of them, the male is the mouth brooder, I believe. Right. The female would come over. When you look over the, the top of the tank, the female would come over and look and challenge you while the male would swim in the tank. I should have pulled them at that point to see whether or not the male was holding. And I. I'd heard that if you did that after a month's time, you could actually salvage the, the fry with still the yolk sac. Right. But if you waited two months, and I did, and I believe they ate the fry, and I'll, I'll never know for sure, but uh, that was one that would have been frosting on the cake if I had been able to salvage. Even one fry would have been worth it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was on the public floor one day and uh, a guy came to me and he says, you know, your, your silver arowanas have bred, have spawned, because I saw a male holding the fry. And he, had, he had, uh, was from New York, and he said, uh, you know, I've, I've never seen a tank with arowanas like you've got. And I guess that the New York Aquarium didn't have, uh, have an exhibit uh, like the one that we had at the time. So I said, did you get it on video? Did you, did you take pictures of it? Because I had been away, I'd been on vacation, and I get back, and he guys, I think he said he, he had taken video or pictures, and I said, well, Jay, if you could find your way of, of sending some of those to me, because I'd really like proof of that, even though what he said happened was is a fry would come out of the adult's mouth, and the paku would just pick them right off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I thought, wow, you know, that would, that would be great to know. And uh, I never heard from the guy after that. So I don't know if he was, he was just, uh, um, just blowing smoke or whether he actually had seen <laughs> some. I assume he had because we had enough of them in there. Right. And I wouldn't see why they wouldn't. Um, uh, so uh, that was pretty special. Um, one of the things... Uh, and once the lights were out, uh, they weren't out, ever out completely because you turn off the, the uh, exhibit lights, we had to have working lights behind the battery because otherwise the tanks were, were pitch dark. And uh, that was just an invitation for things to start eating each other, especially in the gar tank. Because mm -hmm. what would happen, the gars would sink to the bottom where all the cichlids were. And one guy was there one night and they had a power failure and he'd come in 
And he says, I went by that tank, and all you could hear is snap, crunch, snap, crunch, snap, crunch. And I said, well, what are those lights? You know, get those lights on. And uh, I had to uh, convince, gently convince, some of the stationary engineers not to tur t turn out those working lights. Because when you did, those fish can't see each other. Yeah. You know, and that's when they start, you know, your red-tailed cat comes out and starts helping himself, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a struggle at times, but, uh, you know, by and large, it, uh, you know, it worked. I was always interest, uh, interested in, in spawning anything that I had. So. What about as far as, like, uh, as far as, like, fish you wish you would have got an opportunity to, to, to play with while you were there that you didn't quite get a chance to? I mean, aside from the Madagascar cichlids, so, you know, anything uh, in particular that you would have liked to have got your hands on to do a little... Do a yeah, little I, I think I, I pretty much pretty much accomplished, you know, <laughs> what, what I wanted with what we had. I mean, there were things that were just impossible to, to work with because we didn't have the, have the space. There really wasn't anything... Uh, there, the arowanas that I mentioned, you know, that that would have been pretty, pretty exciting. Um, but uh, you know, the other fish were pretty much, um, pretty much uh, standard uh, aquarium fare. We we just had larger specimens than than most people were familiar with seeing, like your you know your tinfoil barbs. We had very large ones, and then we had other barb species and. We had, um, oh, we had a bunch of uh, clown loaches donated at one point. I mean, it would have been nice to work with those. And, you know, they were breeding them, I guess, in the east. And, uh, you know, but, but to br actually breed something like clown loaches uh, w would have been very nice. I got them from, from a couple of uh, sources. And we had, uh, we had uh, I believe, a couple of dozen of them. And they may still be uh, at the uh, at the Steinhardt now in in one of their uh, one of their tanks. But uh, it was a beautiful beautiful collection of these things, and uh, and uh, that would have been it would have been a, a fish that it would have been nice to do something something with. Well, thanks for your yeah, time. Well, it was you're great welcome. to uh, hear your story and uh, learn about uh, all the things you've done in the hobby. So thank you very much well, for you're having welcome. us. Really thanks appreciate for coming. it. Yeah. We'll have to have you come down and uh, visit us at the uh, San Francisco Aquarium Society again. Oh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, once once it, uh, the days get a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have that drive at night. Right. But, uh, right. So I'll, I'll be down. Yeah. I'll be definitely down. Yeah.